All right, but this is my favourite joke of all time, and it only really works on Easter Sunday, so I'm going to throw it out there for you all. And by the way, I just want to uh, say hello to my mother-in-law, Val, here. Uh, now, everybody watch this. It is great and wonderful to have you with here with us. I love you very much, all right? That's my caveat before I start my gag. A man, his wife, and his cranky mother-in-law went on vacation <laughs> to the Holy Land. While they were there, the mother-in-law passed away. The undertaker told them, you can have her shipped home for $5,000, or you can bury her here in the Holy Land for $150. The man thought about it for a while and told the undertaker he would just have her shipped home. The undertaker was perplexed. He said, why would you spend $5,000 to ship your mother-in-law home when it would be wonderful to be buried here and spend $150? She could be buried in the Holy Land. The man said, a man died here about 2,000 years ago. He was buried here also, and three days later, he rose from the dead. I cannot afford to take that chance. <laughs> oh. Anyway, let's pray. That's it for me. <laughs> awesome, awesome. And I, I, I'd pay the money, Val. I'd pay the money. Don't you worry. <laughs> eh? Pay the money any day of the week. Um, hey, First Corinthians chapter 15, if you've got a collection of ancient documents that we like to call a Bible these days with you, can you turn with me to First Corinthians chapter 15? We're going to look at verse 1 to 8. We looked at verse 1 through to 4, 5 and 6 on Friday, but there's more to it than what we covered those first uh, uh, on Friday. So First Corinthians 15, 1 to 8. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you. Gospel means good news. He's saying, I, I, I came out to, this, to your place, to Corinth, and I told you some good news. Who likes good news? I like good news. Okay? We all like good news. And Paul said this gospel, this story of the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, it's actually good news. Sometimes a religion is considered bad news. And that's because sometimes when it comes to Christianity, uh, we're known more for what we're against than for what we're for. Amen? Sometimes it's more about rules. Christianity is about a set of rules. Well, like I said before, today we'd be celebrating the, the, the offering of a book to us, but we're not. God didn't give us a book. He gave us a person. He came down in the form of Jesus. So it's not all about rules and regulations. And if you don't believe me, go back to the Garden of Eden. In the very beginning, God said, this world's great and beautiful, and he created a great space. And then he said to Adam and Eve, you can eat and do whatever you want. You just can't eat from one tree. God gave them one rule. And they still couldn't keep it. We are not good at rule keeping, are we, people? We're not good at keeping rules. They had one rule and they blew it. I can't imagine what the angels are thinking when God went to Moses and said, I'm going to give him 10. And the angels are like, what are you doing? They couldn't keep one. Now you're going to give them 10. But I think that's kind of the point. We're not good enough. We're not good enough. And we never will be good enough. And Christianity is not at its core about obeying a set of rules. It's about a relationship with God. It's about being restored back to our relationship with the one that created us in the beginning. As fantastic as that sounds, we can be restored to relationship with the one that said, let there be, and there was. Isn't that amazing? We can have a relationship with him. Because of what Jesus did on that cross, dying on that cross, taking upon himself a penalty that one day when you and I stand before God, if we got what we deserved, I'm telling you now, if I got what I deserved, it wouldn't be good. Okay, It wouldn't be good. I, I, I am not a great person. I'm not a wonderful person. Uh, I sin. I fall short. I've made many mistakes in my life. But I know when I stand before God, he's not going to look at me in every mistake I've ever made. He's going to look at me and he's going to see Jesus. And he's going to say, enter into your rest. Well done, good and faithful servant. Not well done because you ticked every box and did everything right. Not well done because you never failed. Not well done because you never made a mistake. Well done, because you acknowledge that what I did on that cross 2,000 years ago was for you. You made that decision, and you turned, and you walked with me. It's good news. He says, now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on which you've taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you believed in vain. In other words, it doesn't matter if you believed yesterday. You've got to get up every day, and you've got to walk in faith, don't you? Every day. You don't want to believe in vain. He says, I told you this. And if you hang on to that and you stand firmly on that and you keep believing, this is great. If you, if you don't and you stop and you start going back to your old ways, well, you've kind of believed in vain, haven't you? And I'm sure none of us here want to believe in vain. And in verse 3, he says, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that's what we remembered on Friday, that Christ died according to the Scriptures. 
But then he goes on. He says that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, or Peter, and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. Think about that. He's writing a letter to these Corinthians and he's saying, you know what, There's, it's not just me. There are 500 people. Most of them are still alive today. I'm just, he's not trying to convince anyone of anything. He's writing a letter to a bunch of people that have put their faith in Jesus. This is not trying to spread some doctrine. He's not trying to brainwash people. He's just simply stating, I came to you, shared the good news, you received it. And if you go and read the letter of Corinthians, there was a massive transformation in the lives of these people because of their faith in Jesus. But he's saying, I gave you this message, you believed it, you received it. Things started to shift and things started to change. But, but he's not writing to them for any other reason than, hey, this is just, it's, it's like when you write a letter to a friend. That's literally what he's doing. He's writing a letter to a group of people that believe in Jesus, that have a common faith. And then he says there's 500 other people out there. Most of them are still alive. In other words, if you want to, you can go and verify what I'm writing to you. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to trick you. I'm not trying to trick you. It's like me saying to you, I went to church on Sunday and um, Jackie jumped up on the chairs like, or Owen jumped up on, I'm going to pick on Owen. Owen jumped up on the chairs and he danced like David danced. Everyone knows what that means. Right? Stripped down to his undies and, but hey, you don't have to believe me. There, there, was, there, was, there was 100 other people here last Sunday. Go and ask them. They can verify the truth. You, you don't include all these other people if you're trying to trick or you're trying to lie. He said, hey, it's not just what I'm saying. This is true. There are other eyewitnesses to this thing. Go and ask them. Go and ask them about it. It says he appeared to Cephas and the 12, and after that appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me as to one abnormally born. And Jesus has continued in different ways, shapes, and forms to reveal himself to people in every tribe, nation, every tongue, all across the planet for 2,000 years. Isn't that amazing? And many of you in this room here, at some point and in some way, Jesus has revealed his reality to you too. See, the resurrection is the most important aspect of the Christian faith. Paul the Apostle, who wrote to the Corinthians, he also said this in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 14 and verse 17. He said, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. So if Jesus was not raised, what I'm doing right now is a complete waste of time and you're dummies for listening to it. Okay, we're all fools, we're all clowns. If it didn't happen... And then he says, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Not only, not only is it futile what I'm doing, and not only is it silly that you're giving up a Sunday morning to listen to it, but we're all still in a lot of trouble because we're still in our sins. We're still in our sins. But we believe that Jesus Christ was crucified and we also believe that he did raise from the dead. Did you know there are over 300 verses that speak of the resurrection of Jesus in the Bible? There's over 300. 100 verses again. When I say the word Bible, straight away, people go, oh, religious book, you're trying to... No, stop thinking that way about this thing. We've turned it into the biggest selling book of all time. Written on three separate continents. 27, I think, different authors. 1,600 years. You can't make this stuff up. Spielberg should do a movie about it. Did you know the religious leaders or the Romans at the time of the crucifixion, they could have ended Christianity straight away by simply producing a body or bringing some piece of evidence to the table, any piece of evidence to prove that this guy didn't resurrect? Why didn't they do it? My guess is they didn't have anything. But we do have some pieces of evidence that he was resurrected. There's a whole bunch of letters that were written in antiquity that have been bound together in this book They testify to the fact that many people saw Jesus after the resurrection. Did you know the disciples, they could have caved in under pressure if this whole resurrection thing was just a big hoax? They could have caved in under the pressure. Christianity today has this perception of, you know, prosperity and, you know, Big cars and houses. Like we, we can have this, 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 this perception and people think that Christians, you know, what's the number one thing people say about church? They're only after your what? Money. Your money. That's the perception. I don't think these guys, these early believers, had that perception about them. These guys were persecuted. These guys were driven out of town. 
Following Jesus had a massive cost to them. You didn't follow Jesus because you thought you were going to gain anything materially. You'd only follow this crazy story because you felt like the evidence pointed you in the direction that said this story was true. And what about the existence of the Christian church 2,000 years after the event? I think that is a really, really good thing to think about when it comes to the power of faith and the reality of Jesus. This thing could have been squashed, could have been killed. I'm going to talk in a minute. I'm just going to give you six things to think about. Six reasons why I believe that the resurrection actually happened. Six evidences that I think point us in the direction that the resurrection actually did happen. There was a cartoon some years ago I heard about where two Roman soldiers, they were standing beside the empty tomb and one looked deeply troubled by the empty tomb and the other one was shrugging his shoulders and he said, well, don't worry about it. A hundred years from now, who's going to remember? (laughs) Well, here we are 2,000 years later. All around the world this morning, people are going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Now, if you struggle to believe in the resurrection, then you're in very, very good company. So biblical authors were not only, they weren't trying to sell you something, and that's why they leave a lot of mistakes and doubts and things like that in these letters. Even some who saw the empty tomb still couldn't bring themselves to believe it. Peter, in Luke chapter 24 and verse 12, Peter, it says, Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb when he was told the tomb was empty. He got up and he ran to the tomb, and bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Tilt, tilt. Jesus had already told them on several occasions, I'm going to be resurrected. I'm going to die and resurrect. Peter runs in. Three days later, people come out and tell him there's nobody in the tomb. He runs in. He sees the cloths all wrapped up and he wonders. What are you wondering about, Peter? Jesus said this was going to happen. The tomb's empty. But he's wondering. He's wondering. The disciples on the road to Damascus after the resurrection in Luke 24 verse 17. It says he asked them, Jesus appeared to them, but they didn't recognize him. He said, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still with their faces downcast. I mean, they've been told that the the, the tomb was empty, but they're still struggling to comprehend and believe that this has happened, right? And then in verse 22 to 24, in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, and they didn't see Jesus either. But we're still walking around downcast because we still don't quite get it. We're still not sure. So if you doubt or you don't understand it, you're in actually extremely good company. Read this collection of ancient documents. These guys went through the same process. Even James, Jesus' own brother. Can you imagine being Jesus' brother and growing up with Jesus as your brother? You know, Even his own brother didn't believe he was who he said he was. Until after the resurrection. But not at first. For even his own brothers did not believe him. By the time we get to Acts chapter 1 verse 14, they all joined together constantly in prayer, this small fledgling group of people, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So something happened where James went from being an unbeliever to being a believer and ended up being quite an influential person in the church in Jerusalem. But even seeing a resurrected Jesus was not enough for everybody. In Matthew 28, verse 16, 17, we've got this weird story. Why do these guys put this stuff in here? Well, I think they put it in here because it's true. And here's what it says in Matthew 28, verse 16 to 17. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. This is after his resurrection. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. It says, but some doubted. Can you imagine it? Jesus said, go to Galilee. I'm going to meet you there. These 11 disciples go to Galilee. Jesus appears. And some of them are looking at his resurrected body and they're still doubting. They're still doubting. It's okay if you have doubts. Faith doesn't mean you don't have doubts. Faith doesn't mean you don't have questions. Faith doesn't mean that you understand everything. Let me put it this way. To believe in Jesus takes faith, right? To not believe in God takes just as much faith. Everybody on planet Earth, if you're in this place now, Christian or not, guess what? You're living by faith. You are. You are living by faith. What evidence do you have that there is no God? None of us are on the other side yet. We don't know what's awaiting us. We don't know what's there. If you say God didn't create the world, it was a big bang. Well, that's a faith statement. And where'd the two particles come from that collided? Let's face it, life is about faith. 
You walked in this room today, I did not see anybody put a weight on any of those chairs and test whether that chair was going to be strong enough to carry your body weight before you sat down. You just sat down. What did you do? You acted by faith. You had your wheat bix this morning, you got your wheat bix out, you put your wheat bix in the bowl, you trusted sanitarium that they did their job properly. You didn't break it open, get a Bunsen burner and test it. Do that with your milk. Guess what? You ate breakfast by faith this morning. You, you set your alarm clock last night by faith that it would wake you up at the right time. You got in a car and you drove by faith today. You put petrol in that car by faith, trusting that whoever made that petrol did a good job. Life is about faith, whether we like to believe it or not. As Christians, we just choose to put our faith in the reality of God and our faith in Jesus because we believe there's a lot of evidence that points in that direction. Don't let doubt be something that pulls you back from faith or the possibility of faith. Doubt should be something that if you're serious about your doubts and you want to understand your doubts, doubt should lean you in. When you have doubt, you lean into something and you find out. You ask questions, you examine, you look. So these guys never allowed their doubts to become an excuse to lose their faith. And we've all got doubts from time to time. Easter is a reminder that we have an event-based faith, not just a book-based faith. It reminds us that the Christian faith has substance to it. You cannot understand everything in this book and you can still be a Christian. You cannot agree with everything in this book. But if you acknowledge and believe in the death, burial, resurrection of Christ and that it was for you, you can still be a Christian. There are Christians who believe that speaking in tongues is for today. There are Christians who don't believe it's for today. Is that true? But they're all Christians. Why? Because they all put their faith in the resurrection of Christ. There are people who believe in healing today. There are people who believe God doesn't heal anymore today. There are people who believe all kinds of things. There are people that believe that you can worship with a band. There are some that believe you can only have a pipe organ when you worship. And anything outside of that is evil. There are all kinds of different ways and things and thoughts and so on. But Christianity is not based around all that stuff. It's based around the reality of the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. What makes you a Christian? Do you believe that you are a sinner? Do you believe that Jesus Christ died on a cross not for anything he'd done, but for what you have done and what I have done? And do you choose to put your faith in him? Uh, In the very first sermon ever preached in Acts chapter uh, 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 2, 3, 2, where Peter gets up and preaches and the crowd say, what must we do to be saved? He says, repent and believe. It's, It's simple. Repent. What's repentance? It's not a prayer. It's not digging up all the bad stuff and trying to find things to say sorry for God for. Repentance is not a prayer. It's a turn of of direction and a walking in another direction. Repentance literally means a change of mind that leads to a change of action. That's what repentance is. And what, what, what Peter said to these guys was, now that you understand that Jesus was the Son of God and that you crucified him and you played a role in that, now what do you need to do? You need to repent. In other words, you need to change your mind about him and which will lead to a change of life when it comes to him. You'll start walking and living for him, not fighting against him. And you've got to believe that what he did on that cross was for you. That's what makes me a Christian. Not whether I believe in tongues or healing or you know, whether I go to a Baptist church or an Anglican church or I don't go to a church or a Catholic church. It's the cross. It's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Now, most of us in this room are not going to see a resurrected Jesus face to face. That's the truth. But even if we did, like we just read, there's actually no guarantee that you'd still believe anyway. Is there? There's no guarantee. We all think, oh, if I could just see. Well, hang on. People throughout the ages have seen Jesus. I've got a friend of mine. He's he's got a mate who's a truck driver. And and he, he tells the story that this guy was driving his truck one day. Truck crashed, rolled, burst into flames. And this is the testimony of the man himself, not a believer at the time, this guy himself. He said, I'm in that truck, flames are going everywhere. He said, I'm about to die. And I looked through the glass and there's Jesus. And he said, Jesus walked over to me, opened the door and pulled me out of that truck and put me on the side of the road. Ended up going to hospital, recovered, told everybody, point blank, this was Jesus. Jesus came and Jesus saved me. He saw the resurrected Jesus, pull him out of a burning truck. Four or five years later, guess what? Not walking with Jesus anymore. You can see miracles right in front of your face. It's not going to guarantee faith. It's not going to guarantee belief. So what I want to do now is I want to give you six reasons why I believe the resurrection is is real. Here's six reasons why I believe that the whole story of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus is real and worth considering. And if you're here today and you don't believe in it, I want you just to think about these things. Just have a think about these six things. Number one, I can't fathom a lie that I would be prepared to die for or one that I would be prepared to start and watch others die for. Can you think of a lie that you would start, that you would be prepared to follow right through to the point of death, knowing deep down inside this is not the truth? How many of you think there'd be a certain point where you'd go, ha ha, tricked you, you got me, ha ha. You know? How many of you as children told a lie, and then you told another one to cover it, and another one to cover it, but eventually it got to a point where you realised I'm running out of lies to cover the lie to cover the lie. Okay, you got me, I did it. Right? 
How many of you are telling lies right now and you know at some point you're going to run out of room and eventually you're going to have to say, oh, caught me, I got it. I can't think of a lie that I'd be prepared to follow through to the point of death. And let alone me following through to the point of death, these guys, if this whole resurrection thing was a, was a lie, then 2,000 years ago, a bunch of people started a lie and sat back and watched other people get persecuted and killed for the lie they started. Could you do that? Could you do that? I don't think I could do that. Paul, who wrote nearly two-thirds of the New Testament, got beheaded, literally beheaded in Rome in uh, 67 AD, around 67 AD. He was beheaded because he would not recant his faith in Jesus. He would not recant the fact that even though I was once a persecutor of the church and killing believers, I saw the resurrected Jesus. I repented and believed and started living for him. The Roman authorities came down hard on him. The religious leaders came down hard on him. And eventually in AD 67... He was literally beheaded because he would not deny the reality of the resurrected Christ. Now, I don't imagine that... I'm not going to get beheaded for a lie. Let me tell you that right now. There's a point where I'm pulling back. I'm in prison in stocks and chains. I'm going, okay, you got me. Oh, get me out of here. I want a cheeseburger, whatever. Peter. Peter was crucified around the same time. And, and Peter, uh, church history, tells us that Peter said, crucify me upside down. Because I'm not even fit to be crucified right side up like Jesus was. And Peter was crucified upside down. Whether he was upside down, whether he was upright. Here's the point. He died for that. He died for that message. He died for that truth. Thomas, this one that we call a doubter, he ended up going across to the continent of India and was killed on the continent of India trying to share Jesus with the Indian people. This doesn't sound to me like a lie. This sounds to me like something these people genuinely with all their heart believed in. The disciples had nothing to gain from this story and they literally, culturally, had everything to lose. Everything to lose. This small group of people 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem had everything to lose. But they stood their ground. The second reason why I think the resurrection is worth thinking about and why I believe it's true is because the original documented witnesses that we have you don't use a woman as your initial witness in that culture. If you go back and you read the gospel accounts, the first people that are documented to have seen the resurrected Jesus, to have seen the empty tomb, were women. Women. Well, culture has come a long way in terms of women's rights and equality and so on. But you go back and understand that culture, a woman's testimony wasn't valid in a court situation because that's how low their testimony was considered. Now, if you're trying to come up with a lie or start a story that's going to get a bit of cultural traction and hopefully 2,000 years later still be running right across the world, you start with a credible witness at least, you know? Don't start your story by saying he was resurrected, that's weird enough, and ladies saw him. You've just shot your whole story in the foot. Nobody's going to believe that. Nobody's going to listen to that. Unless, of course, you're not trying to sell a story, you're just simply recording the facts. You're just simply recording the facts. All four gospel writers record women as the first witnesses. Well, they're not the only witnesses. If you want to give a story credibility, don't say a woman saw him first. And not only women, one of them was a lady called Mary Magdalene, out of whom seven demons came. She didn't have a great past either, you know? Why would you say that? I would imagine they're just simply trying to state the truth. Third reason why I think it's worth thinking about the resurrection is the claim itself of an empty tomb. Considering the incredible disruption this movement was to the Jewish order of the day, wouldn't it make sense if they had a body or something that somebody would produce something to discredit this thing straight away? But nobody did. There's nothing documented. There's nothing ever been found that discredits or disproves. You know? People have tried to throw out over the years, oh, we found this, this grave with the name Jesus. Well, just so you know, the name Jesus was as popular as the name John is today. Okay? So it'd be pretty hard to not find the name Jesus somewhere back there in that culture because it was a very, very popular name. But not every Jesus was the Messiah. There was only one Messiah. If the Romans knew about the body, why didn't they come forward? In fact, by 380 AD, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. Not bad for a lie, eh? Not bad for a lie. By 380 AD, Christianity is the official religion of the Roman Empire. Not bad for a lie begun and successfully spread right under their own noses. Pretty impressive. And right up until now, 2,000 years later, there's still no documented evidence around. You would think something so big, somebody would have written down something or somebody would have done something. Or 
There's nothing there. But there is documented evidence that the tomb, sealed by a Roman seal, covered by a one and a half ton stone and guarded by at least 16 Roman soldiers, was found empty. There is documented evidence. Remember, they didn't write books in a Bible. They just wrote what they saw and what they heard. There is ancient documented evidence of a resurrection. Move on quickly. Number four. The first place the disciples preached after the resurrection. How stupid would you have to be? How stupid would you have to be to go straight back into Jerusalem and start preaching about Jesus if you knew that this was a lie? You've run straight back into the belly of the beast, straight back into the lion's den. You would, if, if you're going to start a lie and get a bit of traction, don't go back into Jerusalem where all this happened. Go to some of the outer small villages, get a little bit of a trickle, a groundswell, get a few people that believe, get them to spread it to their friends and some, and kind of build it. These guys walked straight back into Jerusalem. You wouldn't do that. If this thing's not true, there are better places to go. Go to Corinth, go to Athens. Start a rumor somewhere else. Why go back to Jerusalem, the one place on earth where if this was a lie, it could have easily been exposed straight away. Somebody could have stood up when Peter was preaching, go, well, hang on a second, we've actually got this guy here. He was at the tomb. And hang on, we can show you where the body is. Hang on, we know. Crickets. Crickets. Number five. The continued existence of the church, even in spite of all its failings, all its imperfections, its failures of leadership, its immoralities, its mismanagement of finance, its, its, its junk and muck, even in spite of media that can grab that stuff now and plaster it all across the world and, and no longer does it just happen over here but everybody knows about it. Even in a culture now where it is so anti-Jesus and anti-God and if something over here happens, it, it's, it's big news and they make sure that everybody knows about it. Yet the church is still standing. The church is still standing. Think about that. Not bad. Not bad if this whole thing was started on the back of a lie. Millions and millions of lives all around the world have been transformed through this story. Millions. Not bad if it's a lie. I don't think it's a lie. And finally, the last thing I'd leave with you is my own and your own personal transformation story as a result of your faith in Jesus. There are people in this room that have put their faith in Jesus and they all have a story. They all have a testimony. Go and talk to them. Everybody, everybody, everybody will have a different camera angle, a different picture as to why. I put my faith in Jesus at 19. I was, I was a fairly, you know, I'd say I was a fairly popular sort of a guy. I, I, I had a big friend base. I was really good at sport. The only thing I failed at was academics. I wasn't very smart. <laughs> but I think God used that. <laughs> now he uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, he's, but you know what I used to do? I used to go out to parties. I'll get the guys to come back. We're going to finish up. The music has come back. I used to go to parties and things like that. And I, I was the guy that could go to a party and then ramp it up. You know those guys that, that you kind of party can go and then it levels out and then you get that added adrenaline boost. And I could come on in there and ramp it up and I could keep it going longer than anybody else wanted it to. But I could, I could make them want it to keep going too. But I just, I could do that sort of stuff, you know. I played sport. I was pretty good at sport. Made rep sides, all sorts of things. Had a good friend base. Used to go out each night, me and my mates, we would go out to uh, different places and we'd do, we would do what guys do. We would doll ourselves up and you know, go on out and, and, and see what happens when we hit the town and all this sort of stuff. But you know what I'd do when I came home? I'd lay in my bed and when the music stopped and whatever was in your system wore off and your friends were gone, I'd lay there and some nights I'd start crying because deep down inside I knew there's got to be more. There's got to be more to this life than what I can see, taste, touch, feel, and smell. If that's all there is, there's just not enough good stuff there. And I had thoughts about checking out. And one morning, I woke up. I'd been out with my mates, and we'd all done our stuff. And I woke up, and I sat up in my bed. And I was in a little caravan at the back of a petrol station in West Balmer. The petrol station's not there anymore. It's just a concrete slab now. I drive past that concrete slab, and I look at that. Every time I look at it, I think of the grace of God in my life. So I was living out the back of that servo, ran a PowerPoint into the servo, and the guy said, as long as you... Remember the days when you used to pump petrol by hand? Somebody used to actually do it for you, remember that? Yeah, that was the deal. He'd let me live there, and I could use his power, so long as when he was busy, he'd knock on my caravan door, and I used to go out and be the guy that pumped all your petrol for you. You know, it's a good deal. And one day I woke up, and we'd been out the night before, and I sat bolt upright in my bed, and I heard a voice inside of me. 
And the voice said this, if this is all there is to life, Alan, why don't you end it? And I thought that way before. But this day was different. It was such a strong impression. And I knew in that moment, if I had something within arm's reach, I, I wouldn't be here today. And I looked out at my caravan. I got a mate asleep on a table, another guy asleep on the floor, another guy on the lounge, and there's four or five bodies just crashed all around the van. And I thought, man, I've got to do something. I've got to find something. I've got to go looking because if this is all there is to life, it's just not that appealing. I'm not saying life wasn't good. I had friends. I had, but deep down inside, I knew there was something. I found out since. There's, there, one of the passages in this collection of ancient documents, one of the writers uses this phrase. He says that God put eternity in our hearts. And I think that's what it was. There was something in me that went, there's got to be more. There's got to be more to life. So I began this journey, I guess, of looking for God. Found myself on a roundabout in the middle of the Pacific Highway in Ballina. There's a set of traffic lights there now, River Street and Kerr Street. Used to be a roundabout. I stood on that roundabout and with a genuine open heart, I said, God, I think that you're there. I don't understand a lick of this. I don't get it. But I, I just, I think you've got to be there. And if you're there, God, then I need you to show me. I'll give you my life, but you've got, to, you've got to meet me halfway, so to speak. I say, God, I've got a couple of situations in my life. One is I've got a girlfriend. I'm dating this girl. And she looked like Meg Ryan. Remember the actress Meg Ryan? She was, she was a honey for me when I was young. She was the beautiful. Right? I said, God, I'm dating this girl. I'm punching above my weight here. I know I know it. There's no way I'm getting rid of her. So, God... And if I follow you, and, but where, she's walking out, I said, God, I know that I'm going to end up following her. So you've got to do something here. And the second thing was, God, where I live, all my mates are going to come around tonight. I'm going to pray this prayer to you, but my mates are coming around tonight. We're going to get doled up, and I know I'm going to go out with them, and I'm going to keep doing that because I'm just being honest, God, that's where I'm at. So God, if you really want me, you've got to help me with those two things. Within seven days, I went into Lismore. My, 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 my girlfriend was living here in Lismore somewhere, and we were playing touch football Sunday mornings. At, at, at the grounds here. It used to be a Sunday morning touch comp. And I rocked up one Sunday morning and I saw her across the way and I got out of the car and I went and had my game finished. She's on the hill and I turned and I called out, hey. And she looked at me and turned to walk the other way and that was it. I found out years later, her father had told her, you keep dating that guy, don't come home. So she did the right thing. I didn't think I was that bad, but anyway. <laughs> listen to your parents. If you're here, listen, listen to your parents. And then I went back home to Ballin and within two days, the owner of the Shell server knocked on the service station, knocked on my door, sorry. I opened up the door, his name was Rick. And Rick said, Alan, I don't know how to say this to you, but we've gone bankrupt. I said, what? He said, yeah, this particular store, I don't know, we've gone bankrupt. Uh, Shell have come and told me that uh, they're shutting us down. They're going to tear the building down. You're going to have to move. This happened within seven days of praying this prayer. And then I thought, but that's okay, because all my mates that come and crash at my place, one of them will take me in. So I'm ringing up all my mates and so on all for different circumstances and situations nobody could take me in I had one uncle and auntie that could take me in first thing they said to me was Alan we've got a little garden shed in our garage we'll take everything out and put some walls up and you can live in there but you're not having your friends hang around like they did at that van and I thought God if you want me that bad <laughs> I guess you can have me and for the last 30 something years I've stumbled my way down this journey with Jesus but I know this deep down in my heart I've got peace. I know if I die tonight, I know that I'll go and spend eternity with him. I don't fear death anymore. I don't want to die. Let me make that very clear. But I'm not afraid of it. I know that somebody walks with me every day. I know that I'm going to stumble and fall, but I know he'll pick me up. I know that I'm going to have moments in my life where I do things wrong, but I know his grace and his mercy and his love is there for me. And I know that my life means something. It means something. It has purpose. It's not just random chance. I'm not a piece of mud that just globbed together two million years ago and all of a sudden my gills fell off and my wings fell off and now I'm walking. I pity anyone that thinks that's all you're worth. Easter's a reminder of what you're worth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. My father, when I was growing up, he had this uh, habit of going to the local rubbish dump. Remember back in the day when you go to a rubbish dump and it didn't cost you nothing? Yeah, and even better days when you could go to the dump and you could take stuff home. Do you remember those days? And you didn't have to pay for it. My, my dad used to love doing that. My, my, my dad was the guy that our outings, if me and him did anything, it'd be dad, he'd chuck me in the back of the um, uh, Kingswood. We had a Kingswood station wagon. He'd chuck me in the back and say, come on now, we're going to the tip. And we'd go to the tip and we'd dump two or three things. We'd come home with the back and be full of stuff. 
He still does it. He lives down there in West Bowen. And my dad has that much stuff in the backyard that he's taken from tips that he had to go and get more stuff in the rubbish tips to build sheds to put the stuff in that he got from the tip. He's got a shed here and a shed there. You know, it's bizarre. And guess what? One day that's our inheritance. Yes. (laughs) She's never been happy about that one. But you know what my dad does? Here's what my dad does. He goes to the tip. He went to the tip and he found stuff. And he would take it home. And he would put it in his shed and he would get a wire brush and he would scrub it. And he'd get some kerosene and he'd clean it. And he'd, 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 he'd see, pull it apart and go, okay, I can, I'll take that piece out and I can put this piece in and, and fix it. And he would take these broken, decrepit things that somebody looked at and said, that's got no value and no worth anymore. My dad would see the value and he would see the worth in it. And he would grab these things from the tip and he would take them home. And he would turn those things into something beautiful. You know, that's what I think the story of Easter is for me. It's God looking down, going, you have value. Every one of you have worth. You have a purpose. You're not an accident. Doesn't matter what the world has said. Doesn't matter how you felt about yourself. Doesn't matter what mistakes you've made. God can take you and God can change your life. He can literally transform your life. That's been my story. And it's the story of many people in this room. That which was dead can be resurrected through faith in Jesus. Can we close our eyes? Just close your eyes for a second. Just going to ask this once. And it's between you and God. I'm not going to call you up front. not going to make you do anything where everyone looks at you. But I just want to ask you this question. If you're here this morning and you do not have faith in Jesus, and by, by having faith in Jesus, I don't mean you understand everything about him, but there's something in your heart going, you know what, maybe there's some truth to this. I don't get it all. I don't understand it all. But maybe there's something like inside your, your belly bubbling around going, there, there could be something real about this. And you want to begin that journey. I'm going to ask you to do a simple thing. I'm just going to ask you in a second just to raise your hand for me. And all it is, it's just your way of saying to God, God, you've got my attention, Lord. You've got my attention. If that's you here in this place today and you, you want to make that decision today to, to start that journey, walk with Jesus, come into the new life that he offers you, just, just throw your hand in the air for me real quickly. If that's you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Bless you, Lord. Excellent. Why don't we all stand together? Let's all stand together. Now, we had a hand go up there. What we're going to do is we're all going to pray a prayer together. Amen? We're going to pray together. Now, how many of you know what happens when somebody begins that journey or says, yes, Jesus? What does it say in the Bible? It says that there's a party in heaven, right? So we're going to finish with a party. So you're going to lead us in a party song, whatever party song you want. But let's just pray together real quickly now. Dear Lord Jesus. Thank you for your death, burial, and resurrection. Thank you that you so love us. That you gave your life. And Father, today, I make the choice to repent, to turn, and to start walking with you. God, I thank you that you died for me, for my sins. And Father, I receive your spirit right now to empower me to live for you and to walk with you for the rest of my days in Jesus name amen and amen bless you amen